also one point that we definitely want to discuss uh, with you uh, is the your recently developed theory about uh, the so-called uh, informational autocracies. Uh, very interesting. Um, could you maybe explain uh, what you mean by this for our audience and uh, by using the example, uh, what, what you already mentioned during the interview, is uh, the recent poisoning of uh, the opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Could you maybe explain the theory with uh, the example? Yes, thank you for asking this question. So together with my co-author, political scientist from University of California in Los Angeles, uh, Daniel Trisman, we have written a few papers. Uh, to be precise, up to now, three papers have been published. And the one that gives you the better view of this, and which is also sim uh, quite non-technical, is the one published in 2019 in the Journal of Economic Perspectives called Informational Autocrats. And basically our argument is that modern autocracies no longer work through repression, mass repression and fear and ideology. More modern autocracies pretend to be democracies and they try to convince the public that the leaders are really popular. And of course, in modern society, it's not an easy job because you have people who understand what's going on. We call these people informed elites, but you may just think about educated people or people who care about politics. And these people have to be silenced so they don't communicate the truth to the general public. And so the way to silence those informed people is either to use targeted repression, censorship, or cooptation. So you would have a lot of smart people in Russia who do not oppose the regime because they're part of the regime, because they're paid to be uh, co-opted into status quo. And then you also have a lot of smart people in Russia who oppose the regime, but are repressed. And as you rightly mad, uh, mentioned, one of those examples is Alexei Navalny, the opposition leader in Russia. And what is important for Putin is to say, we don't have opposition leaders in Russia. We don't have opposition. All opposition is uh, Communist Party or Zhirinovsky Party. And uh, Alexei Navalny is not a politician, he's a blogger. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when a position leader is poisoned, the modern informational autocrat doesn't do that publicly. So if you go back to 20th century, many dictators would kill or imprison their opponents publicly. They would say, these are the opposition, we uh, have an open court trial and uh, we will put them in jail for being against my regime. Today, informational autocrats, majority of autocracies actually say, no, this guy is a fraudster. This guy didn't pay taxes. This guy forged documents. And this is not just in Russia. I can give you examples on this from Malaysia and Turkey and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. in case of Navalny, what is important, Russian yeah. government denied complicity. They said, it's not us. Mm -hmm. And I think the best piece of evidence on this is the leak of conversation between Vladimir Putin and Emmanuel Macron, where Vladimir Putin to told Macron, Navalny wasn't poisoned. If he was poisoned, he poisoned himself, or he was poisoned by somebody from Latvia. And this was so ridiculous that indeed looks like Emmanuel Macron leaked this, con uh, le leaked this information to the press, which is very unusual. And so this is a typical thing. Now, uh, Putin says, I'm a democratic leader. I don't kill people. I don't censor people. This is how it works. Uh, but, people but love did, me. Did it work? Did it work? Um, what, what they are assuming in Russia? So uh, the citizens? Uh, the majority of citizens don't know who poisoned Navalny. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Yeah. And uh, so if you run polls, you see that there are some people, but they're a minority, are convinced that Navalny was poisoned by the government. And I think this is exactly what happened. But majority of Russians do not know who poisoned Navalny okay. because they are bombarded uh, with all these theories. But are these polls reliable? As we said before, uh, the polls That's are... a great question. That's a great question. I think they are reliable in a way that uh, people are not afraid to say that. And there is research uh, with so-called list experiments. So, for example, when Putin's popularity was 80%, researchers will try to see to what extent this is uh, true or people are just afraid to say they don't like Putin. And what they did, they ran what's known in political science as least experiments. Maybe you know about this thing, but let me explain very quickly. 
I show a, you a list of, say, four politicians and ask you how many of them you like. I don't ask you which one you like, but uh, you just tell me. Uh, you would say one, you would say two. On average, the society likes, I don't know, 1.7 of these four. And then I take another group of people, and to them I show five politicians, the previous four plus Putin. And I ask you, how many do you like? And uh, since we have a law of large numbers, statistical methods, we can actually say the average without Putin is 1.7. The average with Putin is 2.4. So the difference between the two is 0.7, which means 70% approve Putin. And so these studies showed that when public polls would give you 80% approval, list experiments would give you 70% approval. And basically, that means that these polls over-exaggerate support of the government, but not by much, maybe by 10 percentage points. But so but this in, is... But this in is that way, um, Putin lacked a bit uh, as an informational autocracy, uh, is it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Is, is that so, a but, uh, but uh, uh, overall, overall, one other thing, which I think is uh, very important to Netherlands, is the story about the uh, MH17 flight. Again, where Russia behaved exactly the same way, where Russia created a bunch of theories, each of which was fact-checked and dismissed, and is now the court hearings are going on in Netherlands, where the judge actually says, this theory is wrong, this theory is wrong, this theory is wrong. We see that one by one. But this is what Russian government does, especially for domestic consumption, to convince the Russian public that there is a confusion. We don't know. There are too many theories. We cannot really judge what's going on. And uh, this is this is exactly why uh, why and how they they do that. And they did it with MH17, and they are doing that with uh, Alexei Navalny as well. So they say it was Ukrainian jet fighter which uh, shot down this plane, or uh, uh, or uh, it were uh, uh, maybe it was somebody else. We don't know. Maybe maybe they were aliens or something like this. So we don't. Um, is there, uh, with listening to the information autocracy, is there a big difference in age or in, uh, what's, the, what's the bigger difference in age or the location where people live that they believe the government's um, uh, news outlets or at least the information like about Navalny or MH17? Well, that's of course all about informational diet and in what, what information you consume. Of course, internet uh, is helping you to get better information. That's why Russian government is trying to uh, to censor internet. And right now the main battleground is YouTube. And uh, we mentioned Navalny many times. Uh, Navalny, Navalny's YouTube channel is now watched by millions of people, but that's not enough. You need tens of millions, right? And uh, Navalny's uh, support is growing and this is why he's being poisoned. I should mention, you mentioned podcasts. I also have a YouTube channel and I, Every Russian speaker should subscribe to this YouTube channel where every week I, I talk to people and try to talk uh, about what post-Putin Russia should be like. And uh, I think this is important to talk about those things so people are not afraid of uh, democratic transition in Russia. But going back to Navalny's YouTube channel, we have a paper with Nikita Melnikov and Yekaterina Zhuravska, which shows how access to mobile broadband internet and social media actually increases critical attitudes towards government. In one of the case studies, this is a paper which looks information from across the world. It's, uh, it's now forthcoming in the top economics journal, quarterly journal of economics. But um, one of the examples we use is Navalny's movie about Medvedev well, called He's Not Demon to You. So this movie, which was uh, released in 2017, um, uh, was viewed by almost 40 million people. This is the most successful movie Navalny produced. And it completely destroyed Medvedev's career. And we show how Medvedev lost popularity and has never recovered it since. And we also show that, yes, if you have access to YouTube, you are more likely to be critical of Medvedev. And uh, this is very, very important because this movie was not shown on TV. It was only viewable on YouTube. But we also show that if you talk to people who have access to YouTube, you also get a negative impact in terms of attitude to Medvedev. So if you talk to somebody who watched this movie, you de uh, downgrade your opinion of Medvedev as well. Not by as much, but still. And so the answer to you is, 
it's uh, whether you have access to social media like YouTube or you don't. And of course, older people are less likely to be um, on internet and uh, uh, rural areas are less likely to have access to internet. But this is changing. Russia now is much better connected and the main, main battleground is censorship online. Putin is doing that. Putin is uh, uh, trying to censor various uh, social media. And as we speak, they're actually trying to somehow censor YouTube as well. But I'm not sure it's going to be very easy because YouTube is not just political uh, uh, political platform, it's also entertainment platform.